This is the Welcome to Humanity podcast with thought leader and transformative psychiatrist, Dr. Fred Moss. This show focuses on the betterment of humanity on a global scale. Each episode will leave you enlightened, inspired, and ready to make an impact in your world. Welcome to the show. Welcome to your life. Welcome to humanity. Here's Dr. Fred. Welcome to another broadcast of my podcast, the Welcome to Humanity podcast. This is Dr. Fred speaking, and it is another incredibly beautiful day on the planet. As I look out my window, I just see weather that is extraordinary. I see a calmness that's extraordinary. And nevertheless, we're living in some difficult times. And along with the difficulty, there's some beauty. And, you know, one thing about us is we continue to find a way to to maybe be resilient or survive each and every day. And we continue to find a way to make a difference in each and every day and to have a reason to get up and live another moment. So I couldn't be happier today to introduce you to today's guest. Today's guest is Lawrence Gonzalez. And for those of you who don't know him, as soon as I say his name, let me tell you a little bit about who he is. First of all, Lawrence, welcome to the show. It's really fabulous. Thank you. Here. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Before we dive in, I'm going to give you a little bit of what Lawrence has provided for us in the way of a bio and really in a way of getting an introduction to who this man really is or what what he's up to in the world. But we're about to learn a lot more about that. Lawrence is a author of a lot of books, numerous books. He's won a number of awards, including two National Magazine Awards and the Distinguished Service Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. He received a journalism fellowship from Santa Fe Institute, and in that was in 2015. And in 2016, he was given an appointment as a Miller Scholar there. Wow, this goes on and on. And really, I see that there's just accolades after accolades. There was several things that happened. And then it looks like Lawrence wrote a book that eventually got a fair amount of notoriety. And this book is called Deep Survival, Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why? And then its sequel, Surviving Survival, The Art and Science of Resilience. This second book attempted to answer related questions as about how people make bad decisions and what leads some of them to survive and some of them to perish. And I guess it's more an extension from the first book because the first book also touched on that, as I recall. A new book called Flight 232, A Story of Disaster and Survival. And maybe he'll tell us a little bit about that. And wow, he's just he's been a featured speaker and it's uh, he's got all sorts of things that I'm sure he's just itching to share with us. So before we dive into this amazing conversation we're about to have with Lawrence Gonzalez, I want to just take a moment and let you know that my book is put together, The Creative Eight, and the audio release as well. This book teaches a really easy method for healing that utilizes creativity, connection, and self-expression. And as a listener to the Welcome to Humanity podcast, I want to give you a completely free copy of the audio book as a thank you for being a listener to the show. All you need to do is go to welcometohumanity.net forward slash creative and download it. I've used this methodology with psychiatric patients, coaching clients, and even friends, and I get great results. The method takes less than five minutes a day to implement. I know you're going to love it. Go ahead and download it. Let me know what you think. Download your free copy of the Creative 8 audiobook today at welcometohumanity.net forward slash creative. Now, let's get back to our conversation with Lawrence Gonzalez. So again, welcome to the Welcome to Humanity podcast, Lawrence Gonzalez. It's an honor to have you with me today. Thank you for showing up. Well, thank you for having me, and I'm proud to be a human. Say more about that, Lawrence. It is really... There is something about being prideful, about being human. I share that with you, and I share it specifically this morning. It's almost like you're reading my mind. Say what you're sort of referring to when you say proud to be a human, please. Well, we have this extra layer of brain material. We have some other things different about us that set us apart from the other apes. And humans are a type of ape closely related to chimpanzees and bonobos. But we can do things that they can't do. For example, if you go to Ikea and buy a nightstand, it'll come in a box and it'll be in pieces. But if you look at the instructions and you follow them one by one, you'll wind up with a nightstand. 
No, no other animal can do that. So we have this tremendous, wonderful, beautiful ability that can go dangerously wrong <laughs> when we misuse it. And as humans, we often misuse it. And I think the coronavirus pandemic that we're in the middle of is an example of misusing that gift and spreading things around in ways that uh, we just shouldn't be doing. First of all, I think I'm just going to do a little bit of a humorist edge that I'm going to add to what you said. Last night, I opened up a box and inside of that box was something that I needed to construct. So me and my lovely partner, Alexandra, constructed this thing. And it turns out that it actually was for a non-human. It was for my cats. And it was a I have three cats. And so we bought one of those cat hotels. You know, we had it's like a multi-level scratching post kind of thing that yeah. had us screwing in stuff. And and tightening stuff and arranging stuff. And when we're done, we actually gave it to our non-humans because our non-humans wouldn't have been able to do it themselves. So thanks for referencing that this morning. I truly appreciate that. Right. Now, but saying more about getting on this idea of there's a rabbit hole here for us, Lawrence, if we go down the COVID line. So I'm going to ask us to see what are you interested in saying a little bit more about what you said about coronavirus and how that might represent us going awry in a direction a little bit? Well, yes. I mean, if it weren't for intercontinental airline travel, this virus would never have gotten out of China or it wouldn't have gotten very far out of China in the time that it did. But one of the things that I would like to address in a more general way is what deep survival is about is really uh, about the first half of it concerns why smart people do stupid things. And this is a very interesting topic because we can have people who are tremendously smart and who make mistakes, and then they slap themselves in the forehead and say, why did I do that? And so that, that really is about half of deep survival. And the other half of it is once you've done this stupid thing and gotten yourself into a terrible position, how do you get out and what makes you more likely to get out than the next guy? And so it is who lives, who dies, and why. Uh, but it's also all about the brain and all about how we think and make decisions. So it's seen a great deal of popularity, for example, among people who have to make decisions without complete information, like hedge fund managers, for example, or doctors who are treating a pandemic. And then just to briefly describe the sequel, Surviving Survival, that's about after it's all over and you've come out of it, how do you get back to your old life? And the answer is you don't because your old life is not there anymore and you have to reinvent yourself. And so that's what the sequel Surviving Survival is about. Well, thank you. I didn't read the sequel, but as I told you before our talk, I did read The Deep Survival and I read it through my Kindle and Audible combination. I was really moved by it and really moved about the really in the first half of the book, which was, as I see it, more or less like wild storytelling, like not wild storytelling, but wild stories as told. And of people who sometimes really smart or really equipped people making incredibly and often fatal decisions. And then other people who are maybe not so equipped or not expected to survive some sort of disaster, actually not only surviving, but thriving in that circumstance. Would you care to speak a little bit to that phenomena, maybe as an extension of what Deep Survival pointed to? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I talk about in Deep Survival is the fact that in an emergency, you don't make up new behaviors. You do what you've done before. And so the result in, in a catastrophe or an emergency, a survival situation, is often that you discover you've been practicing something all along and never realized it. And so if you have been practicing the right thing, you will probably do the right thing. If you've been practicing the wrong thing, you won't. Here's an example. There was an FBI agent, and I'm not sure if this story is in the book or not. I can't remember. There was an FBI agent who decided that it would be useful to him to learn to snatch a gun out of someone's hand. And so he began practicing this, and he practiced and practiced and practiced, and he actually got really good at it. And, you know, that was a tool in his toolbox that he had just uh, learned for himself. Sure enough, one day he was out on the street and a guy pulled a gun on him and he snatched the gun out of the guy's hand before the guy could pull the trigger. And then he gave the gun back. Now, 
Of course, in hindsight, he understood, and he was terribly shocked by this behavior. His own behavior shocked him. His partner had to shoot the guy. and But looking back, he realized, of course, that's how he practiced. He'd snatch it from his partner. He'd give it back. He'd snatch it. He'd give it back. And this opens up a whole area of human behavior that's fascinating, which is how we make everything automatic. Think about this. If we have a, a grandson who's about to turn four, and we're trying to teach him to tie his shoe, it's very difficult. It's very laborious. You teach him step by little step, and he tries it, and he fails, and he tries it, and he fails. But he has to do it by rote, just like putting together the IKEA nightstand or the cat uh, hotel. You have to do it step by step at first. But there comes a point where suddenly he gets it. He's taken all these little steps, he's put them together, and now all of a sudden he knows how to tie his shoelace. Well, that's a really remarkable thing because he has taken something that requires all of his concentration and turned it into something that requires none of his concentration. That's true. Which is mm-hmm. it's kind of a miracle. Yes. Um, but it's what we do with everything if we do it enough. So if you want to learn tennis, you're going to be like the four-year-old trying to tie his shoe and you're going to be flailing around Somebody's going to have to be telling you where to put your hand, where to put your arm. But eventually you get it and it becomes a tennis serve and it's a beautiful thing um, Mm -hmm. and it's completely automatic. And as you know, being a psychiatrist, I'm sure you know this. If you try to think through it, you'll ruin it. Right. Oh, yeah. Trying doesn't seem to be an additive influence in any way, actually. That's right. And so so this is all part of our regular daily human life. So in the case of the FBI agent with the gun, he had been practicing something with, with a what they call a training scar. He had a, a piece of the training that was wrong. The important lesson is when the emergency happened, he didn't edit his behavior. He didn't invent new behavior. He did exactly what he had practiced. And that's what we all do. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be aware, like, All of us are practicing something all the time without realizing it. What is it? And what will it do to us when we get into an emergency? So this brings up a couple questions for me. And I imagine maybe even for my listeners, there's something. um, So thanks for that succinct and beautiful explanation. I can really see the book shining through your speaking. So um, it's really beautiful to hear you speak. Thank you. Thank you. It seems to me that there is a type of practice, like I want to learn how to play tennis or I want to learn how to, I don't know, ride a bike or be a swordsman or something. There's a kind of practice that I get started with that isn't real. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, but this isn't this is just preparing for the real. And so that's sort of what it sounds like this FBI man had here. And here's your gun back. Let's try that again. Almost like he wanted, maybe he could do it five or seven times with this man so he could really get it down. Or like as the practice, it was the idea that it was an exhibition season, that it wasn't a true, honest emergency. Maybe he was practicing for someday, practicing for someday rather than practicing on real time. Do you see what I'm pointing to here? Like without the urgency or emergency during practice, are you risking not being ready when the emergency happens? Yeah, there's a possibility of that too. But I'm thinking more along the lines of, uh, think about this. You're stuck in a traffic jam. Now, how do you react You're on your way to something important and you're stuck in a traffic jam. Are you going to pound the steering wheel and yell and scream? Are you going to say, hey, guess what? I live in the United States of America and this is where traffic is. I think I'll just Mm -hmm. turn on my radio and listen to some classical music or practice my French or whatever, right? So if you're used to being calm in your regular life, it will help you to be calm in an emergency. And, and and this is something that I think people lose sight of. They think they can behave one way in their regular life and then suddenly rip off the Clark Kent suit and become Superman in the emergency. And I don't believe that it happens that way. And so there's a kind of Zen element to the book Deep Survival in which I talk about staying calm. That There's a place in the appendix of the book where I give 12 traits of excellent survivors. And the first one is perceive and believe. And it means... When something bad happens, most people tend to deny it. That's the first reaction. 
the good survivor will say, you know what? I'm out mm-hmm. here on this mountain and I just broke my leg. Something something has to change in the way I relate to the world now because the world around me has changed suddenly. Mm-hmm. And then calmly go about it. So I'll tell you a survival story that didn't make it into the book because I met this guy too late. His name is Vito Sascunas, and he was in Grand Teton National Park one year, middle of winter, and was going to do a solo cross-country ski. So he parks in the parking lot, gets his skis on, takes his pack, and he goes. And about five miles out, he hit a little hill and turned wrong and suffered a really bad spiral fracture of his leg and ankle. So he sat down. And he thought, okay, well, I'm five miles out, middle of winter, deep snow. Nobody's going to come out here. No cell phones at that time. Nothing like that. I doubt he would have gotten reception anyway. So he takes his pack off. He opens his pack. He doesn't try to splint himself or anything. He takes everything out of his pack to assess what he has. Then he lights his stove. He makes himself a cup of hot tea, gets out some food, makes himself a meal, sets up his tent, and goes through all of his gear. Now, this is a guy who's reacting in a very logical way to a very highly emotional event. And there's a key here that, again, as a psychiatrist, you'll get this immediately. Emotion and reason tend to work like a seesaw. So if emotion is very high and stress is very high, you tend not to be able to think clearly. If you can get something going that works by the logical stepwise part of the brain, the neocortex, the one that helps you put together the IKEA furniture, then you can bring that emotional level down, down, down until you can think clearly. And that's exactly what he was doing. So then he decided, here's what I need to take with me. I'm going to scoot on my butt and I'm going to dedicate every hundred moves to someone Mm. or something back in my life that I love. So he did 100 moves, dedicated Mm. it to his wife. He did 100 Mm. moves, dedicated it to his guitar. He Mm. did 100 moves, dedicated it to his cats, and so on and so forth. And this is a crucially important part of his survival, and he did survive, is that he was socially connected to something back in the world where he wanted to go. So he had a high motivation to do this right and to get it done, block out the pain, and just focus on this is the world that I want to get back to, and I love all these things, and I love my life, and Sure enough, he got to the parking lot, got in his car, and managed to get to a hospital and live. So so this is a perfect kind of survival scenario, especially at a time like now when we're looking at something like having to stay home. My wife and I are basically homebound right now. And you think, oh, well, if only I could just go out and go to the grocery store, or maybe I'll just go out and get my hair cut. And we have to sit back and go like, no, this is like Vito Sascunas. We got to scoot on our butts for a while here <laughs> and dedicate something to the life we want to get back to. Thank you. I am hearing uh, two things again that I want to bring to attention, which is that this in the practice, back to sort of an extension of the last thing we, we addressed together here, it seems like it's not a practice necessarily of what you do in any stressful situation, but that who you are, what you be in that situation. And in the world of uh, psychology or psychiatry, this idea of being and doing, being different than each other, that when you speak to calmness, that's more of a way of being in particular emergent situations than which lever to pull next or which button to hit next or which phone to number to call next. You know, more or less what you're saying is that you, what I hear you saying is that Uh, You go into a state of mind that then delivers a certain level of being that then dictates your likelihood of survival one way or another. Is that accurate or can you correct it if it's not? Yeah, no, that's accurate. Um, What you do becomes who you are or you become what you do to a great extent. But it is a way of being in the world. And it's a way, so there, again, as a psychiatrist, you'll know about this literature probably that, that refers to the locus of control. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are people who go through life saying, oh, woe is me, this happened to me, and that happened mm-hmm. to me, and, and bemoaning their fate, uh, and they think like a victim. Mm-hmm. And there are other people in the world who feel like they have agency in the world and like, oh, I tripped and sprained my ankle. Instead of saying, I'm going to sue this store that I happen to be in front of, they say, wow, that was really stupid. I got to pick up my feet and be a little more careful about how Mm -hmm. I walk. Uh, And that person has what's known as an internal Mm -hmm. locus of control, Mm -hmm. right? 
Um, and, and people who have an internal locus of, con- locus of control approach life that way. They approach life like, oh, that's broken. I, I can fix it. Uh, or not, oh, that's broken. Woe is right. me. And so developing this, po- you know, and again, in the book, Deep Survival, I call it positive mental attitude, which is what the military uses. That's the term they use. Uh, and it is. I mean, that's what it is. It's like, you know, you only go through life once, right? So how are you behaving? Is this what you want to be, this complainer? Or do you want to be the person who can take things in hand and make them exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. I have, you know, you bring up that you only go through life once. And, you know, and you, when left in those situations, uh, how you be or you know, who you've practiced to be up until the point, those situations, meaning a survival situation, a catastrophe, tragedy, um, uh, an accident or, or, you know, natural disaster, etc. How one behaves is a function of how one has behaved, at least in practice up until that point. I have another question here, which really has been dogging me as I went through your book a little bit too, which is, I'm 62 years old. I've lived a um, I've lived an amazing life, and I've been in two car wrecks, both of which are considered death defying. You know, I rolled a car into the woods going 90 miles an hour, side over side, and you know, a, here I am. And that wasn't so much my personal skills, or maybe it was. I don't know. And I've lived. I now have what I say is a life that doesn't have much of a bucket list left. Done what I've done, and created what I've created, and become who I become, and I'm. Pleased to say that I'm at a space that's very enjoyable, having earned the stripes that I have to now be 62 years old and speak like this. Okay, here's my question. When I was a little more of a fledgling youngster, I feel like I was tenacious in on the edges, wanting to live, wanting pep, absolutely among all else, like the desire to live and desire to sidestep all troubles was the way I went through every day. I wonder if that's been decreased recently. If somehow I'm like, yeah, my time comes, my time comes. Can one lose their interest in surviving a tragedy? I guess that's what I'm saying. And what really shows up at flash time? Have you done any looking at that? So can one, yeah, you know, lose their motive? Like maybe it's, maybe I'm okay now. Maybe it's time to go or something like that. Yes, of course. My wife and I went through recently her her mother's death at the age of 93. And Debbie and her mom were like sisters. They would go to Florida every spring. They palled around together. They Debbie would call her almost every day, and they'd chat for half an hour or an hour. And so this was a big deal. But in the recent time, like about a year maybe, uh, Margaret, her mother, had just gotten to the point her her health was so bad and she was in pain all the time. She had congestive heart failure. She was in and out of the hospital. And she had really said to to me and Debbie, you know, I'm done. I'm through. Uh, And legitimately, I mean, she wasn't suicidal. She wasn't depressed. She was 93. And and she did pass away in Mm -hmm. February. And, And it was like we had all been through a year or so of watching her suffer and thinking, gosh, this, this is no fun mm-hmm. anymore. So, so yes, I believe it's true. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm 72 and I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't exactly have a bucket list cause I've led a very full, exciting life, but I've got these wonderful grandkids exactly. and I'm married to a wonderful exactly. woman and I have my writing and I have people like you to talk to about the things that are important to me. And so I'm trying to, here I am stuck at home in the middle of a pandemic and I'm really lucky because I get to talk to you, great? you know, so how great is. is that? It is great. And I think what I'm really pointing to is the quality of the vigor. In other words, I'm really interested in living. I The other day, last night I was taking my nightly walk and I was like, and I was thinking about today's conversation with you. And I was like, oh, and that was before I built the cat hotel, by the way. And I was wondering, in some ways, if pressed again, if pressed into a survival situation, perhaps maybe hopefully not like the level that you speak of in your book, in your books, 
that there's even a greater interest in living here, even though there's another, there's sort of like a a calmness about, well, maybe I'll live and maybe I won't. That wasn't there when I was a child or even a teenager or an adult. Now there's like a calm truth to, you know, I might, I might not live through this one. And that doesn't mean that I'm less interested in living. In some ways, it's being more in touch with the reality of the circumstances. Well, in one of the stories in Deep Survival, I talk about a guy who did, in fact, break his leg on a mountain. I know. And, oh, my goodness. And, uh, oh my goodness. and his approach was very much like that. His approach was, I'm in Peru. I'm at 19,000 feet on a snow-covered mountain. My leg is broken. I'm dead. However, however... And this is the important part. Even though I think I'm probably going to die, I'm just going to do the next thing I can do. Exactly. And and he does every day. And this, I think, took him, I forget, like three days to get down. But he just did the next thing, the next right thing in front of him. And every day he was saying, you know, I might die today. I probably should die today. But I think I'll just do the next thing I'm capable of doing. And he got Mm -hmm. out. Yeah. In some ways, that's just how I live every minute of yeah. life, you know? Yes. It's like, really, it's like, okay, I, I don't know. I have no effing idea what's up here at all. I have no, no, what I just did is kind of pointless or useless. I don't even know what direction I'm facing. I might as well just do the next right thing. Well, one of the things that people who read uh, Flight 232 come back to me with is th- this idea of like, well, you know, it can be taken away from us in an instant. Uh, we live in a contingent world where, you know, you can walk out on the street and get hit by a bus. And so you want to keep two things in mind. One is you don't want to be hit by the bus and then be lying in the gutter thinking, I should have had the ice cream. Go ahead and have the ice cream. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the other thing is you shouldn't be taking your life for granted when you live in a world where you might die at any moment. You should be enjoying every bit of it. Mm-hmm. Last night. And now, just yeah, now that now that you've become essentially a friend of my last night, um, we got we got to walk, and then we got the building of the hotel, and then I was lying in bed at midnight. I don't know if you know this, but around midnight last night here in California, there was an earthquake. Oh, no, and, I didn't. Um, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it was. It, I was lying. I was um, hugging, you know, my partner, and we just really had just drifted off to sleep, and I was a. a I'm not from California originally. I'm from Michigan and I've lived here for a few years, but I was awoke, you know, I was awakened by an earthquake. Yeah. And it was like, holy cow. And, you know, the bed shaking. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this could be it. Like, this could be it. Yeah. You know, this is, a, it turned out to be a 3.8, seven miles from here. But it was like, yeah. Wow. This could be it. There's this right now. This that's a good. This is a good indication that on any given second, like right from you know, all we need is a seven point six right now, and voila, that's it. So, you know? what part of California are you in? We're I'm in Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in earthquakes there too, and if you're from the Midwest, like I am, it wakes you right up. <laughs> it does. It does. And there was something that Alexandra said to me, which was, you know, to there's there's an opportunity when your world shakes like this to pray from deep inside your core, like to just it isn't really praying for mercy. It's about acknowledging something about survival about living, about taking that next breath, no. about not taking anything for granted right now, like right now while the world is shaking. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's I, really quite beautiful. I talk about that in uh, Deep Survival, and I talk about a firefighter uh, named Peter Leshak who wrote a wonderful book called Ghosts of the Fire Ground in which he talks about praying, you know, as a firefighter, getting stuck in a life-threatening situation is a very real and proximate thing for you. And he's been in in a number of those. And he says, you know, praying for me isn't about God. It's about sort of silently acknowledging the reality of your situation and embracing it and saying, okay, this is the real situation. Now I'm going to do whatever I can do that's next. And this- yeah, it's like a- Settling, like a resetting or yeah. something, like a grounding. Right, right. Y- yeah. Yes. 
We're on with Lawrence Gonzalez, a writer of Deep Survival. You mentioned that you also share with me that you don't have much of a bucket list, but you don't think you're done. You have your grandchildren. You got a whole, you got your writing. You got many things, conversations with other people. You have uh, who knows what's coming around the corner and that you've lived an extraordinary life. And along with your relationship with your father, which I invite you to take on now, if you'd like, I'd like you to point to one or two things in your life that our listeners might be able to enjoy with you or appreciate with you that have led you to be the master in this particular area of study that you have become. So what kind of things contributed to Lawrence Gonzalez being Lawrence Gonzalez, the writer of these books and the speaker to these aspects of what it means to live through tragedies and disasters? So when I was a little kid, I began hearing about my father's experience in World War II. When I was a little, real little kid, I can remember I was probably three or four and I was short, you know, so I was looking at my father at about shin or knee level and his legs were covered with scars. And I always wondered about, and his feet were deformed too. And I wondered what had happened to my father. And as I grew up, I learned more and more. Uh, He was shot down over Germany. He was a B-17 pilot during World War II, and he was shot down over Germany and fell 27,000 feet without a parachute. And this this story is told in deep survival in some detail. But the long and the short of it was that he was very severely injured and was recuperating when I was born. I was born in 47, so the war had just ended. He was still an an injured pilot. Well, I grew up very interested in aviation. So when I became a journalist in the early 70s, I began investigating airline crashes. And the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, investigates those crashes and does the official report on them. And I was kind of dissatisfied with the way these reports would read because I would say, well, here we've got uh, this pilot of this airliner. He's an ex-military guy. Uh, He flew fighter planes. He's got 30,000 hours of experience. He's got a master's in engineering. This is a really smart guy. So how did he manage to do the stupidest thing that a pilot can do and drive his plane into the ground? And they would say to me, well, uh, we don't know because he's dead and we can't interview him. And so we leave that part out. And I thought, well, wait a minute. That's the most interesting part. The most Mm -hmm. interesting part is not the mechanical aspects of the accident. It's like, what was this guy thinking when he drove drove his plane into the Everglades or wherever it was? (laughs) Yeah. Um, And so that really started my career. So between my father, one of the big questions with my father was, if he had been killed in the war, I wouldn't be here. And of course, me being a little kid and the most important person in the world, that was a profound thought to have, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, thinking it was an existential thing for a little kid to think about. uh, What if I wasn't here? Um, And the other thing was, well, why did he survive and the rest of his crew got killed? Which Mm. I I think the answer to that one is just it was was chance. But it started me on the road of thinking both about airplanes and about survival. Doesn't he have a, a line about lucky? Yeah, he would say he was just lucky. And one of the things that we know from success in business is that the most successful business people, when they ask, well, how did you do it? They'll say, I was just lucky. And I think that a survivor's attitude is humility. And part of that is not beating your chest. The experts say the Rambo types are the first mm-hmm. to go. Humility is very important. And part of that is admitting like, yeah, there's a lot of luck involved in this. Thank you for that. Here comes the next part of your life. What is this, you know, how does it unfold from here? And where do you start getting like some traction into not only looking for these things, but coming up with things and then loud and clear enough to be able to deliver to us others? So from studying airline accidents and reporting on them, I began to look at other kinds of mishaps and began to realize that big accidents are organized. They're not chance. You know, you'll see something in the newspaper that says, oh, it was a freak accident. It was an act of God. And I started to say, wait a minute, I see commonalities among like an accident like the space shuttle and uh, a plane crash or an accident like the space shuttle. I'm actually working on something right now that is attempting to show the similarities among three things. One is the two space shuttle accidents. The other is the destruction of the Great Lakes, which has been going on for more than 100 years. 
and the third is the coronavirus. And all all of those three categories mm. are connected because they basically violate the 12 rules of survival that I have in Deep Survival, starting with perceive and believe. And without going into a great deal of detail, basically, in the case of the space shuttle, they saw things happening that were not designed to happen, and they refused to believe that it mattered. Mm -hmm. With the uh, Great Lakes, they saw Mm -hmm. things happening that they knew were really bad, like invasive species, and they refused to believe that it mattered. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, like Michigan's 400 miles long. How can a little a little fish uh, change it? Well, it did. And the third, the coronavirus is they saw it in China and they went, well, we don't really have to worry about this too much. And the result is what we're living with now. So in all three of these mm-hmm. cases, it's people's thinking that got them into trouble. And so this, going back to a time say, in the 1980s, a couple of things began happening that influenced my work in survival. One was the publication of a book by Charles Perrault called Normal Accidents. I believe it was in 1984. And Charles Perrault put forth the theory that in very complex systems, accidents aren't accidents. They're part of the way the system functions. If you build an aircraft carrier you're building accidents into the system because it's so complicated. It has so many moving parts. It, it can't avoid accidents. And so if you, if you have an accident and you say, oh, here's a fix for it, we'll put some more technology on it, you may just be making the situation worse by making the system more complicated. And so this is a, an mm-hmm. element of survival mm-hmm. that began feeding into my work. The other thing that happened was along about that time, they started developing brain imaging technologies that became MRI and uh, positron emission tomography and various ways of looking at the brain functioning so that we could go back and start to answer that question that I asked about the pilot. Why did he drive his plane into the ground? Well, you can now look at the brain and see how it's functioning and say, aha, here's a part of the brain that lights up when you're scared and it's called the amygdala, and it stops you from doing things that you might otherwise do to help yourself, and it makes you react in an automatic way. You reference on a couple of occasions sort of this automaticity of at least a butted up against when you speak about the space shuttle accidents. Even given like an overwhelming amount of information that my next step, if I was to take it, is co- totally dangerous and perhaps even deadly, If my motivation is such that I want what I was going after anyways, I will be blind to that level of overt, obvious information that makes that next move untenable. And I do it anyways, and then I'm dead. Like, what is up with that? What is it? Tell us a little more about that level of blindness. Well, again, it's the seesaw of emotion and reason. And the emotional system is one of several systems that protect us. It's constantly gauging the safety and danger of the world around us and constantly monitoring and motivating our behavior in relationship to it. So everybody's had this experience. I'm here alone in the house with my wife, but it's very possible and it has already happened that I come around a corner and I think she's up in her office where it's actually she's walking down the hall. And as I come around the corner, I come face to face with her and I go, oh my gosh. And my heart's beating Mm. and my blood pressure shoots up. My muscle tension Mm -hmm. changes. I have this tremendous boost of adrenaline. And I say, huh, you scared me. And then we both laugh. And this is a complete emotional sequence that we're all familiar with. And my intellectual knowledge of my situation does me no good. I know that I'm at home. I know there's nobody here but my wife. I know there are no bears in this house. And so what am I reacting to? And this is the nature of that automatic system to hijack our behavior in an emergency. And it's evolved this way over millions of years because it works most of the time. It works most of the time. So on a statistical basis over millions of years, more people survive by using it than by not using it. So we're stuck with it now. Um, And that's what exactly you're talking about. You get that emotional motivation to do something. And before you know it, you've done it. And you look back and you think, wow, that was really stupid. Why did I do that if you live through it? 
Yeah. Like I think the kayak story with the flooding, it's like they have every tool necessary to determine that this is not a good day to be on the river. And I mean, it's incre- like not even close to an acceptable day to be on the river. And yet brilliant people with tons of experience make a decision to go out on the river anyways. Right. And what I say in Deep Survival is saying that someone is experienced may just mean that person has done the wrong thing more times than you have. Exactly. <laughs> and and people always say this, and they're saying it right now today, every day on the TV, I'm hearing this, like, well, we've always done it this way before, and nothing bad has ever happened. Right. That's right. Statistically, you've been lucky. Mm-hmm. Right. Incredible. And so right now in Georgia, I hear they're opening up bowling alleys and tattoo parlors. It's like, good luck with that. Yeah, I saw Sanjay Gupta on TV just yesterday. One of the few things I saw was uh, him. Um, I don't, I don't watch much, but I did see him. He's from Georgia, speaking to that. And yeah, we'll see, see how that goes. Yeah. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna begin to wind this down. One of the questions: Is there any questions that? You, well, let's put it this way: Is there anything that we haven't addressed or that you'd like to bring forth? either as a question to me or maybe an open question to the listeners, something to think about, something that you're where you're at in your evaluation or your exploration or maybe even your recommendation during these times having to do with the coronavirus or maybe just having to do with being a 72 year old grandfather and talking to the truth. Anything you want to say? (laughs) Well, uh, I'll speak to being a 72-year-old grandfather or any, any age grandfather, that, that I have learned so much over my lifetime from my children and now my grandchildren. And when I first had children, I didn't know a lot of the things that I know now. My elder daughter, Elena, was born in 81, and I didn't know how smart kids were, and I didn't know how complete they were as human beings. And they're not proto-human beings. They're fully fledged human beings. And they have these handicaps, one of which is they can't talk initially, and they can't walk, and they have to develop all this muscular coordination and such. But they know so much that's going on. And we can really learn from our children. And now with the grandchildren, I'm paying so much more attention and really listening to what they have to say and watching their behavior. And the kids are having a blast. So both my daughters, daughters are at home. They both have two kids, a boy and a girl each, and they are playing with their kids and listening to their kids and doing things with their kids and inventing lessons with their kids. And everybody is having a really good time. And to me, not, not everyone can do that. My mother, by the way, is 99 years old and in a, a nursing home. She doesn't have the same ability to connect that we have people calling her on the phone and things like that. But she's in a kind of isolated group home. But with the grandkids, I try to get on Skype or Zoom or one of the visual connections we have wonderfully today and read them stories. Or I'm playing chess with my eight-year-old grandson. Things like that are extremely important right now. And those who have access to them need to do that. But the other thing is just to realize, essentially, I'm old enough to remember my my parents talking about what it was like during the Depression, what it was like during the war. And we're in a situation like that right now. You can't just throw a switch and undo what's happened. We're going to have to live through it, going to have to be very patient and calm to get through it in one piece. Yes, it really does take all kinds, but it does seem like calmness in the face of adversity certainly seems like a virtue. It certainly seems like something worth bringing forth when and if it's available. And if it's not available, then making it available. Calmness seems important. Yes. And now is the time to do those things you always wanted to do, like learning to paint or learning French or starting to do yoga, whatever. There's, there must be something, something that you've dreamed about doing. Learn to knit. And I will talk very briefly about two circuits, two pathways in the brain that are very important to think about. Not every uh, neuroscientist agrees on the terminology, but uh, some of them call this one pathway the rage pathway. It's very easy to see. You just step on your cat's tail by accident and you'll see it. The rage circuit, the claws come out, the screaming happens, the struggling, the grimacing, all of that is automatically activated by this series of places in the brain that they call the rage circuit. You can see another bit of evidence in a cat's behavior when the cat is stalking prey. The cat will get low to the ground, very goal oriented, quiet, rhythmic behavior, and it can't make noise or it'll never catch any prey. So the this circuit called the seeking circuit disables the rage circuit. 
And so because they go through the, some of the same areas of the brain, you can't have both at the same time. Humans are very good at finding activities that activate the seeking circuit, such as knitting, playing sports, running, playing a musical instrument. These are all things, depending on what you like, that can absorb your attention. And every one of us is familiar with saying like, oh, when I'm playing piano, I just kind of lose myself. And that's what's happening because the rage circuit can't happen. And if you're if you're afraid and in a dangerous situation, you're starting to activate that rage circuit. You're getting antsy and irritable. You find something that activates the seeking circuit. That's brilliant. I totally get it. Part of who I am for uh, my patients is something called the Create. It's a book I wrote and it's in audio form. It's just coming out this week, actually, called the Creative Eight. B- really built on what you're saying, which is that most of the symptomology or the the psychological discomfort that we experience is a result of or can be combated or counteracted with just being creative, creating from nothing, art, music, dancing, singing, drama, cooking, writing, gardening, those kinds of things that really, once we sit down and start creating from nowhere, it does seem like, it doesn't just seem like it, the the concerns that we had that led up to it just dissolve instantaneously in many cases, so. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And everybody can find that activity that does that. It's really great. One of the questions we like to ask our guests before closing, and I think you probably saw it when dealing to set up today's talk, is if there's one thing going on in the world that really does bother you, that really still tweaks you, that really has it be it's what you wake up and think, I sure wish that this would be different, or I sure wish I could make a difference there. Is there anything that you can think of that really you know, takes the lead among all others about something going on in the world that you really feel committed and dedicated to stating is an issue that tweaks you? Well, I think it is exactly what I talk about in these books, Deep Survival, Surviving Survival, and so on. And it is that people are most of the time not paying attention to what's going on around them. And they're not believing the evidence of their senses. And so they're living mindless lives instead of mindful lives. And it's exactly this kind of lack of thinking, lack of paying attention that Uh, leads us into the kinds of troubles we're in, in so many ways. I mean, not just the coronavirus, which will eventually go away. Global warming will not go away. Climate change, if you like to call it that. And the Great Lakes will not reinvent themselves, which is 20% of the fresh water in the world is a very important thing. Water in general is the next nuclear war, as far as I'm concerned. But all of this comes down to one thing, which is living aware, Awareness. I I was hoping that was going to be your word. Got it. Yeah. And this is a Zen practice. And how how, how do we do that? How do we do that? Us unaware folks, us people who are just buzzing through the world, just getting it done, you know, not really looking around us. How would how would you instruct us as if I'm one of them to uh, to put a higher acuity? It goes back to the thing I talked about, automatic behavior. How do you learn to tie your shoes? And you learn to tie your shoes by stopping thinking about it. And we live our whole lives without thinking about it. And so you have to be able to literally go out. And my wife and I do this all the time. Go out and look at a tree and say, my God, that is a beautiful tree. Look at the look at the tree. Look at the way that tree has grown. And look at the form that it takes, the amazing fractal complexity of that thing and how it's processing energy. And you start to take your little world that you live in and start seeing the things in it as a practice of becoming aware of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And you start, and I talk about this in Deep Survival, you start acting like, you start asking questions such as, you know, what's really going on here? I'm coming down this trail in Glacier National Park And there's a big pile of bear scat on the trail steaming, and I walk right by it. Now, wait a minute. Where did that come from? You know, there must be a bear here. And I'm speaking metaphorically, of course. Working hard to get out of automatic behavior and into perceiving and believing what's really going on in your world. It's hard to do. Sure. And what's the alternative? You just glide through your life and the bus hits you. Yeah, exactly. And the bus might be cancer, and it might be coronavirus, and it might be something else. It might be any number of things, but but the point is you, you miss life. <laughs> you know, you don't want to wake up and be 90 years old and say, wow, I, I missed the whole thing. I had my iPhone to my eye, and I wasn't watching. I was going to catch my life on reruns. 
Right. Well, I can say with some degree of authority, having now spoken with you, and it really has been a gift and an honor to have this conversation with you, that at least in our case, we have lived lives that are valuable. And we've reached a point now where we're pouring it back or that we're committed to at least uh, speaking to what we know and which isn't very much ultimately, um, and nevertheless really continue to receive and then give, give it, it right back. back, pour it right back. Exactly. And it's yeah. all I'm about. Yeah. I really noticed that that's, I'm so looking forward to the next <clears throat> third or maybe even quarter of my life that is, that is in front of me for me to just pour it, just pour it right back. And let me, let me just add to that, that if you are in the position of giving as opposed to taking, it makes you much more powerful and it makes you a better survivor. If you can find someone in this situation who needs your help, and I'm speaking to the audience here, that that you can help somebody like that, it's so much more useful to your survival and you're getting through this thing to have someone to help. And and so find somebody who's worse off than you are. That's a really great point. The the end of the Creative Eight, so that I just said, the Creative Eight was art, music, dancing, singing, drama, cooking, writing, and gardening. Those are the original eight. Then there were two more that were added on, which was photography and cleaning, and cleaning in the big form. And then the, the 11th one, the Trump card, if you will, is help anybody do anything. And I think that's what you're speaking of. That's the one that works if all 10 of the others are somehow not available. Like just bring that on and that is a guarantee to work. And that's, I'm, I'm with you 100% there. Yeah. It makes you a rescuer instead of a victim. It really does. And back to internal versus external uh, locus yeah. of control, you really, really get an yeah. opportunity to have an internal locus of control and make a difference. Yeah. All right. Well, Lawrence Gonzalez has been with us. What an awesome conversation. Thank you so much. It has been a deep pleasure. And to my listeners, it's I just want to, what did you get from today? And, and there's something like, there's an opportunity here to get something for yourself. I mean, you can look at, at Lawrence Gonzalez and say, ah, he's that kind of guy. Or maybe even look at me and say, yeah, but that's Dr. Fred. He's that kind of guy. But the real situation here is you're that kind of person, whoever you are. And there's a real, just some things I think we touched on maybe intentionally and inadvertently today, Lawrence, that are going to maybe tweak our guests into looking at their lives a different way. And my goodness, if there are some people who wish that they could do that even once in their lives, and I think we just got to do that in today's conversation. So I'm totally grateful. Thank you for having this conversation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's been beautiful. We are indeed in the midst of the coronavirus lockdown or quarantine or stay at home. And it's an incredibly gorgeous day here on planet Earth. And I, like Lawrence Gonzalez, am deeply proud to be a human and to be here with you. And take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Take care of the people around you and get some rest. But when the time comes, just do the next right thing. Thanks so much for tuning in today. So one of the things I really want to point out about today's interview was like this man has really been on the edges with people that have actually survived unthinkable circumstances and with people who haven't. And he's so smooth and easy with just discussing the truth on this like human edge. And for me, just going out on those limbs and going out with him really gives me a visual and, I don't know, a full sensual experience of what it is to survive. And he's done his research. And so, wow, now I know some of the traits that it would take to survive some of those disasters and catastrophes. Amazing guy and so much fun to talk to. Perhaps as you were listening to this, you thought of maybe someone you know who really, really could benefit from this episode. So go ahead and reach out to them right now and invite them to listen and to subscribe to the Welcome to Humanity podcast. And while you're at it, well, why don't you hit the subscribe button on your podcast player? Once you do that, you'll be able to get the latest episodes as they become available. And on top of that, if you would like, if you really enjoyed this or other podcasts that you've listened to in the Welcome to Humanity bunch, could you just take a few minutes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts? We'd all really appreciate that. I'd be truly grateful for that support. Also, to catch up on past episodes, head on over to the welcometohumanity.net forward slash podcast. Until then, this is Dr. Fred, and this has been another wonderful, wonderful version of the Welcome to Humanity podcast broadcast. 
Thank you so much for listening. Have an awesome day.